I mean, that's that's a huge deal. If you think about it, you can render things that you've never even had a chance to take a picture of before. Hey everyone, I'm Adam Kelly. In this video, I wanted to share some progress I've made on a 3D rendered synthetic data set I've been working on. So if you've been following the YouTube channel for any length of time, or the blog for even longer, then you know that I have made some progress with synthetic data sets in the past. I started out with a cigarette butt detector that was built using sort of just pictures of cigarette butts that I cut out and then pasted over lots of different backgrounds with a Python script. I released that as open source code, uh, the Coco Synth repo, if you're looking for it, uh, I'll put a link in the description. I also did the same thing with weeds uh, where I took pictures of weeds and cut those out and then put them over uh, lots of backgrounds of different uh, types of grass and stuff and then tested that out. It worked really well. And also lots of students in our course on creating Cocoa data sets, uh, they use the same method and it works out really well. So uh, clearly this method can work using, uh, you know, just randomly pasted foregrounds over backgrounds. But what I'd always wanted to try was a foreground that was only 3D rendered, that there was no actual true picture uh, being introduced to this data set. I still wanted to use uh, just normal backgrounds, but not anything, uh, any actual photos of the object. So uh, the first challenge was to come up with an object that I could 3D model. And uh, my first thought, just looking around my house, was something like this water bottle. I was like, oh, you know, that's simple enough to model. I can do that. Well, this wouldn't be a very big challenge because uh, the Coco data set already has bottles in it. So I'd be retraining a neural network that had already been trained on bottles to only find bottles. So that didn't make any sense. Uh, I wanted something a little more challenging. Uh, and the solution I came up with was these reading glasses. So these present a really interesting challenge. They're not that difficult to 3D model. Uh, and they introduced this challenge of not only are the frames a little bit uh, transparent and reflective, obviously the, the lenses themselves are transparent. So that makes this more challenging and those glasses are not included in the Coco data set. So it'd be a true test of whether a purely 3D rendered synthetic data set could be used to train a neural network to detect objects and images or videos. So for the rest of the video, I'm going to show you how I modeled this, uh, modeled the glasses and the journey I went through rendering them and creating a data set that was representative of what actually, you know, was going to be in the photos that I wanted to detect these glasses in and then show you the results I got, which I'm actually pretty impressed with at this point. I think there's lots of room for improvement and certainly the method was kind of hacked together. So I think there's a lot of room to improve the workflow from beginning to end, but overall I'm super excited uh, and I want to show you what came of all of this. This is the order of steps that I took to get the neural network trained. So step one was to create the 3D model in Blender. Step two was to create some sort of way of taking pictures of the glasses from lots of different angles in Blender. So I generated a path that the camera could follow. Step three was to render at all of those different points along that path with a transparent background so that we could get images that could be pasted over top of backgrounds. Step four was to gather a bunch of background images. I had a bunch of pictures that I'd already taken from around my house for a previous project, so I just added a couple more to that to make it have a decent representation of the environment that I would be taking pictures in. Step five was to use the Coco Synth repo to generate a series of training images. So you can see just that little preview where there's some sample images of glasses sort of pasted over top of backgrounds. And then step six was to train the neural network and then test it out on real images, not using any 3D 
rendered stuff anymore. Those were just purely real images once I had finally trained it. The first step was to model the glasses in as realistic a detail as I could. And I have been using Blender for a couple years now, but I don't consider myself to be an expert modeler. And I want to show you really quick how this model isn't necessarily as difficult to create as it looks. When you look at it like this, yeah, it looks like it would be pretty difficult to make, especially if I were to turn on, not that one, this one, and you can see all this detail and you'd wonder how the heck do I make something that detailed? Well, let me just uh, clue you in a little bit to how this would work. So if I hide this collection briefly and I show you the reference images I was using, so I basically took pictures from a few different angles and used them uh, so that, you know, from the top, from the front, and from the side, you could see the different things you can do. So then what you do is you basically build a really simple shape. So if you look at this in edit mode, you can see that the vertices to create this are not that difficult. Um, I'm confident that anyone with some beginner Blender knowledge could create a shape like this. Then what you do is you select a, an edge like this, and then you can, there's something called a bevel tool, which allows you to smooth it out kind of like this. Now I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but that's how you would create a more smooth version of this, which ultimately would look like this once you applied a smooth modifier on it. So hold on, I'm a little bit, let me hide this and show you without smooth on, in edit mode, this is basically just that previous shape I showed you with some extra uh, beveling around the edges. And then as soon as you turn on the smooth modifier, suddenly it looks just like what I showed you before. So that's how I managed to model something that looked so realistic here. It was really just using reference images and then a smooth modifier to create this. The next step was to take pictures of this from lots of different angles. And I could do that manually by placing the camera and then hitting render and then placing another position and hitting render. I wanted to automate this process and Blender is an animation software, so it's pretty well suited for this task. I just needed a way to make it so that the camera would take pictures from all those different angles. What I landed on was using a path and you can kind of see it. I basically created this uh, dot path here and then it smooths out the path in between. Then the camera is inside of a, an object that follows that and I just animated it so that it would follow this as the number of frames had progressed. So it's using a couple constraints so that the box follows the path and then the camera keeps pointed at this uh, at the glasses in the center but aside from that this is fairly straightforward how it's creating lots of different images from different different angles. So after I set up this camera rig, I needed to get a realistic render. And for that, I needed materials and lighting. So the materials actually were pretty easy to get working. Uh, once you know the very basics of how to get a glass effect going to make it look more like plastic, wasn't that big of a deal. So simple tutorials on how to make glass in Blender get you pretty much exactly where you need to be for, for that. And then I wanted to use HDRI images for the lighting. And if you're not familiar, HDRI images are these 360 degree high dynamic range images that can apply light to objects in your scene. So you can kind of see this website, hdrihaven.com is awesome. They're free and sponsored by a Patreon. So uh, if you use them, um, they, you know, you, you can use them completely for free, but he just encourages, or the creator, um, he or she encourages you to just contribute to their Patreon. And then you get these awesome lighting effects. You can see that the transparency is affected by it as well as the reflections and the lighting. So it really makes for a very realistic looking object. So what that looks like when you render is something like this. So this is a very realistic looking uh, thing. Compared to how the glasses actually look in real life, it's actually pretty incredible that this looks as good as it does, in my opinion. 
It's not perfect. Yeah, a person can tell the difference between the two, but no one would deny that these glasses look like glasses. So the problem was at this point, I didn't want this background. I didn't want the, you know, the grass in the background. I wanted this to be representative of my actual house where I was going to be taking the real, the actual photos where I was going to be doing the detections. And because I don't have the, uh, equipment to take HDRI images of my house, I wanted to basically remove the background so that I could then uh, save off images that were just the glasses. And that turned out to be pretty easy. Um, it was just a matter of finding this transparent thing. And let me just make sure I've got the camera placed well here. And then if I render this, you can see that it removes that background image. So this is the uh, the way that I generated all these images. I rendered out about 500 frames of this, and then I was able to um, save these off. And I did I wrote a little script that would crop out the unnecessary pixels as well, so that I had about 500 foreground images of these glasses from taken from different angles. Once I had my glasses rendered, I had lots of those images, but I also needed some backgrounds that I was going to compose them over top of. So I used some photos from around my house because that was going to be where I was going to be taking pictures of these glasses for testing purposes. I would think you'd want to, if you were doing something similar, uh, you know, and you were going to do more outdoor detection, you'd want a lot more outdoor images, but I just wanted to do indoor for this test. Then I used the CocoSynth repo. And uh, so that's basically a GitHub repository that I have created and open sourced where you can basically just take in backgrounds like the image on the right and then compose foregrounds that have some transparency randomly over top. So what it does is it creates a training image that it already knows which pixels belong to the foreground. And so it's able to create those annotations in Cocoa format for you so that you get these training images. So I generated a lot of these training images and also some validation images. And uh, just to, here's a couple examples of what those would look like. And then I trained Yolact. So training took about eight hours in this case. I basically just kicked it off and let it run overnight. And I trained with 4,000 training images and 1,000 validation images. If you've never heard of Yolac before, then it's something you should know about because it's a really awesome real-time instant segmentation neural network. So it's able to detect not only the bounding box of an image, but also the pixels that belong to that object that it's detecting. And unlike previous object detectors like this, it actually is able to do it in real time, meaning like 33 frames per second, as it says right here. So that's kind of a huge deal, and that's why this is one of my favorite new object detectors that I've been using. And I made a couple tutorials on how to use Yolact uh, on immersivelimit.com. If you just go to the tutorials page and search Yolact, you'll find this. Uh, and there's a helpful tutorial that will teach you how to train Yolact uh, with a custom data set. So that is basically the method that I used for training Yolact. After training Yolact for about eight hours on the pure synthetic data set, I ran it on some real images. So these six images are real photos of actual glasses. So there's no 3D rendering, there's no pasting of foregrounds over top or anything. And actually the bounding boxes turned out great. I was really excited when I saw that. Uh, it meant that clearly something was working here. And you can see in the basically everything except for the bottom right, it got it perfect for the bounding box. Uh, the bottom right, it did get a false positive with that little guitar stand in the background. But I figured that was probably just due to not having enough training backgrounds or something like that. So uh, the thing that was a little disappointing, though, was the masks don't really work. Um, the pixels are supposed to be shaded in where it found that object. So as you can see in like the top left picture, the frames kind of got ignored on the front completely. 
and I learned a little new uh, terminology for glasses. Those are called the temples, the parts that go over your ears. Those got partially shaded in. It's kind of spotty, and that kind of uh, holds true for the rest of the images too. It, it gets the temples okay. It gets them a little spotty at times, and then it completely ignores the lenses and the parts of the frames that are more see-through. So uh, there were only a couple there where it got any part of the lenses. And it should be getting 100% of the lenses. If it's working properly, these should be much more defined shaded in regions. Now, of course, I was hoping to get this right on the first try, so uh, I was a little disappointed when that didn't work out for me. But uh, I had some suspicions as to why this wasn't working. And the main suspicion was that if you think about what's happening with glasses, you're always going to see some background behind. Let me see if I can position this. So you can see my, my skin here is visible through the glasses. Well, when I was rendering them, I had rendered transparency around the frames of the glasses, but the lenses were not transparent at all. They were showing whatever was behind it when I rendered it. And because I was using these HDRI images for the lighting, it was rendering a field or a sidewalk or, you know, a photo studio or whatever it was that I was using. And so no matter what angle you took it from, you weren't going to get any images that were truly representative of what this would look like in the environments that I was going to be taking photos of it. I think if I had HDRI images of my house, then that probably could have worked. It would have been close enough, but because I didn't, uh, that was actually a problem. So uh, I was a little bit stumped as to how to solve this problem. And uh, back when I worked at Microsoft, I was on the HoloLens team for three years. And one of the teams that was very close to my team was the synthetics team at Microsoft. So I reached out to one of my old colleagues uh, that I had met during that time, Pedro Urbina, and asked him if he had any advice on how I might be able to proceed and, and improve this. And uh, he looped in someone else, John Henzelka, and together they suggested a couple different things. And one of them showed basically how to, in Blender, how to make it so that not only does it render transparency around the, the frame, but also through transparent things in whatever object you're rendering. So I tried that out and it was like night and day. It looked so much better, so much more realistic. So I just wanted to give a big shout out to Pedro and John and just say thank you so much for the help. Uh, it really got me moving again. And uh, so I was able to make those changes and I'll show you what those changes look like so you can see what happened. So the problem was when these images rendered, they would show whatever was behind it. I needed to get rid of this and replace it with the transparency effect. And the technique is actually pretty simple. The node view of how this shader works is normally it goes directly from the principled BSDF shader to the material output. But if you use a transparent BSDF, and you mix it with some sort of amount, and you feed that into the material output, which let me do that on the glasses as well, or the glass. And you can see that the amount that it's mixing is much lower uh, for the glass, for the lenses. But then when I render it, you'll see that it's actually still showing some, some foreground here, some of the glass reflection, but, it's transparent, so you can see whatever's behind it. So I rendered those glasses out again and created a whole new training data set, and the images looked more like this. Because that transparency effect was now there, you could actually see the background through the lenses, and this looked much more realistic. So I fed in these training images, I retrained Yolact for about 11 hours this time, and I actually made the training data set smaller. I only did 2,000 training images instead of 4,000 and only 500 validation images instead of 1,000. I had a suspicion that it was probably overkill for what I was trying to do just because there was only one object type. 
And as for why I trained it for longer, that was just because I went to bed and when I woke up, it had been 11 hours instead of the last time I'd trained it where I went to bed and it had only been eight hours. These are the results. And it's like night and day. I mean, the masks on these are excellent. The top left image looks perfect. The middle uh, top image has a little bit of overlap. It can't really tell where one pair of glasses ends and the other begins, but I think that's forgivable. Um, in this case, they're, they're pretty close together. Um, the other ones look great too. I mean, it, it really did an excellent job. And you can also see that the background um, in the bottom right image, it's no longer picking up that false positive. I think I might have changed the, the threshold a little bit to intentionally leave out things that weren't close to 100% um, certainty. But I mean, I was very excited. These results were um, awesome. So at this point, I started wondering, well, if it works so well inside the house, would it work if I exposed it to some backgrounds that it had never seen before? Let's try some new variation. So I took it outside, uh, took a picture on the grass, which worked pretty well. Did another in a more dirt dried patch that worked well, even with some really weird lighting, uh, the blue one, it worked pretty well there. The only one that it failed of the test images, I mean, I didn't test tons of images, but when I put it in the wood chips, I mean, that's kind of hard. Even even for a human, I would say they might not spot those glasses at first glance. So um, it's not terribly surprising that that one didn't work out so well. I never tested on any of these types of backgrounds, so I'm just impressed that it worked at all. And then I thought, well, what if I tried other pairs of glasses? Surely that won't work. I was wrong, so I tested it out on a couple pairs of glasses that I it had never been exposed to at all, um, and those ones worked. And then I just as a long shot, I tried it out on some safety glasses I had, and it even figured those out in some cases. So I was just kind of stunned by this, honestly. Sure, it's it's not great, it's not amazing, but I mean, really, if you think about especially that top right image with those mostly completely transparent safety glasses. The fact that it was able to find anything there is, is amazing to me. So at that point, I got a little suspicious and I'm like, all right, well, what else can it detect? So I, I tried more variations of the, of these glasses and was like, well, if I, you know, don't always give it the glasses in that pose, does it still detect them? And you know, then it started to fall apart a little bit here. So the top left image, I don't know if it was too close to the camera or what, but it didn't think those were glasses at all. Um, and then top right, I mean, it still did okay. It found the, the glasses part. It just wasn't really familiar with uh, the shape of the temples in that case. Um, I mean, you can see, and actually what you can't tell uh, from the bottom right I believe I actually tested different colors of glasses. I have a couple different uh, shades of them. There's one that's kind of brownish, one that's kind of bluish, and then one that's black and clear. Um, had no problem detecting all of those. And so I was like, all right, this is ridiculous. So I, I took a, I drew uh, on my whiteboard a picture of glasses, and then it found that. And I was like, all right, something's up here. So I started taking pictures of other things that might look a little bit like glasses. And I think I kind of figured out what the problem is. It hasn't been trained quite enough on um, negative examples of things that are still in the same color range. So while it didn't pick up anything like the pen and, you know, those other like the cable and plastic on the top right, it did it was pretty confident that it had found glasses when it saw some of the bottom left, the cables there, and then the whiteboard thing in the bottom right. So let's just say this thing still needs a little work, but the fact that it can detect glasses as well as it does, even glasses it's never seen before, even glasses drawn on a whiteboard, is pretty impressive to me. Honestly, I'm pretty blown away by how well this worked and how much I could do in my limited free time. I pretty much put this together over the course of a couple weekends and evenings, and I was able to do it all myself, which is kind of amazing. I was able to 3D model something, figure out how to render it to a point where it was realistic enough that uh, basically a neural network couldn't distinguish between what was fake and what was real. 
I mean, that's that's a huge deal. If you think about it, you can render things that you've never even had a chance to take a picture of before. Um, I mean, the possibilities there are endless, really. So this is just I'm definitely going to make more content on this, uh, but I would also love any reinforcement if you uh, if you guys are excited about this, too, and you want to see more content like this. Uh, let us know, reach out to us on social media, leave a comment, you know, uh, subscribe to the channel. We'll definitely be creating more content about this, but as for how much and, you know, how soon that might depend on what you guys are most excited about. So, uh, as always, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for all the positive feedback. It's always so encouraging to share stuff and then, you know, hear what you guys have done. Uh, you know, taking on some of these projects, learning from our tutorials and all that, it, it just means a lot uh, to both myself and to Kayla when we see those comments. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you next time.